أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما لنا ألا نتوكل على الله وقد هدانا سبلنا ولنصبرن على ما آذيتمونا وعلى الله فليتوكل المتوكلون وقال الذين كفروا لرسلهم لنخرجنكم من أرضنا أو لتعودن في ملتنا فأوحى إليهم ربهم لنهلكن الظالمين ولنسكننكم الأرض من بعدهم ذلك لمن خاف مقامي وخاف وعيد واستفتحوا وخاب كل جبار عنيد من ورائه جهنم ويسقى من ماء صديد يتجرعه ولا يكاد يسيغه ويأتيه الموت من كل مكان وما هو بميت ومن ورائه عذاب غليظ مثل الذين كفروا برب بهم أعمالهم كرماد اشتدت به الريح في يوم عاصف في يوم عاصف لا يقدرون مما كسبوا على شيء ذلك هو الضلال البعيد ألم تر أن الله خلق السماوات والأرض بالحق إن يشأ يذهبكم ويأتي بخلق جديد وما ذلك على الله بعزيز وبرزوا لله جميعا فقال الضعفاء للذين استكبروا إنا كنا لكم تبعا فهل أنتم مغنون عنا من عذاب الله من شيء قالوا لو هدانا الله لهديناكم سواء وقال الشيطان لما قضي الأمر إن الله وعدكم وعد الحق ووعدتكم ووعدتكم فأخلفتكم وما كان لي عليكم من سلطان إلا أن دعوتكم 
فاستجبتم لي فلا تلوموني ولوموا أنفسكم ما أنا بمصرخكم وما فرت بما أشركتمون من قبل إن الظالمين لهم عذاب أليم وأدخل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها خالدين فيها بإذن ربهم تحيتهم فيها سلام ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون ومثل كلمة خبيثة كشجرة خبيثة اجتثت من فوق الأرض ما لها من قرار يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة يثبت الله الذين آمنوا بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ويضل الله الظالمين ويفعل الله ما يشاء صدق الله العظيم باسم الدائرة الثقافية في حكومة الشارقة يسعدني أن أقدم في هذا اللقاء الأستاذ أحمد ديداد الداعي الإسلامي المعروف والذي سبق أن التقيتم به في عدة لقاءات على أرض هذه الدولة المعطاءة ومحاضرته لهزو الأمسية عبارة عن جزء مما أعده الأستاذ ديداد لمناظرة ستجري في جامعة لويزيانا في الثالث من نوفمبر المقبل وهي أي هذه المناظرة امتداد لسلسلة من جهود الداعي الإسلامي في توضيح وجهة النظر الإسلامية حيال الكثير من الادعاءات والتحريفات والتشوهات التي يعاني منها المجتمع الغربي وبخاصة فيما يتعلق ب التوجه والتصور الاسلاميين في المجتمعات الغربيه. وما يقدمه الاستاذ ديداد عباره عن تحضير فكري لاطروحاته في تلك المناظره وما يقدمه في هذا اللقاء امتداد لما قدمه في دبي وبناء على رغبه الكثيرين 
ممن لم يتسنى لهم المشاركة في تلك الأمسية نأمل أن نتمكن خلال لقاء هذه الأمسية من التعرف على وجهة نظر الداعي الإسلامي الأستاذ ديداد وأن نساهم معا بما نطرحه من تعضيد أو تساؤلات أو تفسير لبعض الأمور من استكمال وجهة نظر تقف بصلابة في وجه المغرضين والذين يتخرصون على الدين الحنيف ونأمل أن نستمتع جميعا بهذه المداخلة التي تأتي في بداية الموسم الثقافي السادس الدائرة الثقافية وأن نعتذر مسبقا عن كون هذه الأمسية ستدور باللغة الإنجليزية بناء على طلب الأستاذ المحاضر وذلك منعا لأي التباسات أو سوء تفسير قد لا يؤتي بالنتائج الطيبة المفترضة في فهم أطروحات الأستاذ ديدات Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure on behalf of the Department of Culture, Sharjah Government, to present to good selves uh, the Islamic uh, scholar, Mr. Ahmed Didat, in a preview of his debate entitled, If the Bible God's Word, and we hope that in spite of the fact that this uh, presentation will be in English, that we all could participate to the maximum possible and we enjoy uh, this uh, good uh, presentation of Mr. Didat. Please have a nice time and we hope that uh, we participate in the discussion as much as possible. Thank you very much. Mr. Didat, please. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فويل للذين يكتبون الكتاب بأيديهم ثم يقولون حاز من عند الله ليشتروا به ثمنا قليلا ويل لهم مما كتبت أيديهم وويل لهم مما يكسبون صدق الله صدق الله صدق الله نور العظيم my, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman has just vanished. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, I have just read it to you, a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, that is chapter 2, verse number 79, in which Allah Ta'ala tells us about the people of the book, writing the book with their own hands, and attributing it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This book, the Holy Bible, they say this is the book of God. This is dictated by God. Allah says, no, they have written this with their own hands and they're attributing to me. So woe to them who write this and woe to them for what benefit they get thereby. Now this subject of the Holy Book, the Bible, is a subject of a debate to take place in Louisiana in America on the 3rd of November it's almost around the corner and I was on my way there when the brethren in Pakistan here they said look we want you to share with us you know what is going to happen there because we can't all be present there please tell us something about it I had spoken on this subject at the folklore hall and the hall was too small people get couldn't get in and so by public demand I made to repeat that lecture from the folklore hall so i hope 
Some of you who might have been there, please bear with me. The subject is, is the Bible God's word? Now, this is a question that is being thrown at me over and over again by the Christians. Say at my public lectures, every lecture is followed by questions and answers. We do not want to push anything down people's throats. The Christians don't do that. They lecture to you for an hour, two hours, they push things down your throat and no questions. Take it or leave it. So in other words, you are made to sit like sitting ducks and they shoot at you and they go away. Now, we do not take unfair advantage of people of other faiths. When we speak on any topic, he said, at every time, you have a right to question, to rectify the man, expose his falsities, whatever, you have a fair chance. So, at question time, generally, the Christians ask, the missionary, do you believe in the Bible as the word of God? If you say yes, you are hooked, and if you say no, you are hooked. It's either way, it's head I win, tails you lose. If you say yes, then he makes you to accept each and every word and phrase as the word of God, as binding on you. If you say no, he tells his other Christian brethren, he said, you see, this man doesn't believe in the Bible, what right has he to expound it? So either way you lose, heads I win, tails you lose. So in answer to that, I ask, the Bible that you are asking about, whether I accept the Bible as the word of God. So I said, do you accept this Bible as the word of God? He said, what Bible is that? I said, why? I thought, you say, the whole Christian, well, there is only one Bible. If there is only one Bible, then why should you ask me what Bible is this? Now, at the back of his mind, he knows that there is not one Bible. They have versions and versions of the Bible. There is a Roman Catholic version of the Bible. There is the authorized King James version of the Bible. There is a new world translation by Jehovah's Witnesses. There is a revised version of the Bible. There is a revised standard version of the Bible. There is an American standard version of the Bible and on and on and on. Different, different versions of the Bible. So the Christian says, you see, it's the same as your translations. You have translations of the Quran done by different people. Version and translation is the same. We say version, you say translation. He says, no, 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 no. It is not so. You see, the translation of the Quran done by Mami Duk Piktor, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, by uh, Maulana um, Maududi and on and on. These are translations where the person has a choice of words. A choice of words. He can use different terms for the same thing. Synonyms. But the version, the difference the version makes is this. That this is the oldest Bible. This is the Bible of the Roman Catholics. The Roman Catholics. They dumb over 700 million in the world today. You know, Baba, Pope. The Pope as the head. This is their Bible. And this Bible has 73 books inside. There are, the Bible consists of so many books. Like we say surahs in the Quran, they talk about books. And in this Bible, which is an encyclopedia of 73 books. But the Protestant world, the rest of the world, you know, they call themselves Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and on and on and on. There are a thousand sects and denominations among the whites of South Africa and 3,000 among the blacks of South Africa. They opt for this, known as the authorized version or the King James Version of the Bible. Now, this Bible has 66 books. This one had the first one, though it looks look so small and stumpy, I don't know why the Catholics keep, Catholics keep on producing things in this f format. But this, seven of the books that are in there, the Protestant world threw them out. They threw them out. We know nothing about these things. They are telling us, they say, no, 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 no. Those seven books are not authentic. They call them apocrypha. It's a technical term meaning zaif, weak, doubtful. It is of doubtful authority according to the Protestants, so they threw it out. So can you see the difference in aversion? Seven books thrown out. Seven less, seven less here. 
So it's a different thing from the Quran. Nobody takes out a surah. Nobody takes out a verse in his translation and he says this is a, a version of the Quran. There's no such thing as a version. Translations, yes. Same verses, maybe a variation in the terminology. That is the translation. This is a version. Seven books, less in the one that's accepted by the masses of the other Christian world, the Protestant world. So, do you accept this one? The Christian says, no. Then I said, look, why not? So he said, there are doubtful things inside there. So I said, look, I agree with you. I agree with you. You say doubtful, so I agree with you. That there are doubtful chapters there, books there. Now the Christian is offended with us for taking such a stand. I said, look, we know nothing about this thing. You tell me and I accept what you tell me. So you say this is the best. This is what you're using. So all right, I said, let's have a look at this. I said, you see, this one goes to 1611. This is quite a recent production from the printers. But the text goes to 1611. But in recent times, they have revised the Bible into this one here. It's called the Revised Standard Version. So what's the difference between this version and that version? So now we are told that this version is the most up-to-date version of the Bible. It goes back to the most ancient manuscripts. Most ancient. This one here goes to the ancient. Ancient means four to six hundred years after Jesus. The manuscripts. This one goes to the most ancients, two to three hundred years after Jesus. So nearer the, the origin, nearer the source, the more authentic it would be. Common sense. So they say this goes to the most ancient, so therefore this is the most accurate. And certain tributes are paid to this book by leaders of Christianity. They say the Church of England newspaper says about this new version, RSV, Revised Standard Version. It says the finest version which has been produced in the present century. This is the finest version produced in the present century. Church of England newspaper. A completely fresh translation of, by scholars of the highest eminence, says the Times Literary Supplement. The well-loved characteristics of the authorized version combined with a new accuracy of translation, says Life and Work, another publication of theirs. The most accurate and close rendering of the original, says the Times newspaper in, from London. The most accurate and close rendering of the original. So, if you say so, then we say, right, we are prepared to listen to it now if this is the most accurate we want to see what he's got to say so this one now supersedes all translations as a book of authority authenticity so inside there they are paid certain tribute to this one here which the pro protestant world uses and even the roman catholics even the roman catholics they don't use their own in the vernacular, in the native languages, they use what is done by the Protestants. So every Bible that they give out, even the Roman Catholics, the seven books are missing. They use the Roman, uh, the Protestant Bible because it suits them. They are printing it, the Protestants, they buy from them and they sell to the sheep. They don't want to produce this one in the vernacular. In the Arabic, it's not to be got. You can't find it in Zulu, Khaza, Chana, any other language, Urdu, no other language of the world, only in English. So if you want any other language, you'll have to buy this, the King James Version. But we are told here by the revisers of the authorized King James Version, I'm sorry, the Revised Standard Version, they tell us that this King James Version, in the preface I'm reading from there, he said the King James Version has with good reason been termed the noblest monument of English prose. It's the noblest monument of English prose. Its revisers in 1881 express admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, its power, its happy turns of expression, the music of its cadences and the felicities of its rhythm. 
it entered, as no other book has, into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking peoples. We owe to it an incalculable debt. We owe to it this King James Version, a debt which you can never repay. I'm asking Muslim learned brothers of ours, literate people, educated people, can you pay a better tribute to the Quran than this? If this was said about the Quran, I said, can you improve upon it? You can't. Beautiful tribute. But I'm telling my Christian brother, and I said, now look, this is the testimony tributes being paid to the Bible that you're using. Now, prepare yourself for the shock, not from me, from 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They produce the book. They pay the tribute. Now, prepare for the shock. It says, yet the King James Version, this one here, has grave defects. It has grave defects. By the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those on which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. The defects are so many and so serious. So it calls for revision. So they revised it. We want to know what those defects are. Shouldn't we know? They are telling us they are defective, that thing is defective and serious, not just small, small things, not tiny little, little differences, variation, no, no, no. Serious, so grave. So we said, now let's have a look. Now the generality of mankind has got no time. You've got no time to start going wading through this Bible and this Bible and this Bible to know what is involved. You haven't got the time. So what I have done is I have produced a book. Is the Bible God's word and this book tells you all these things absolutely free the only thing you have to do is to write out a small note to Ahmad Didat that's my name PO box 1818 Dubai and get it if you help us with postage good and well and good but if not no conditions are made so give us your zakat give us your lilla and you get this book every book publication of mine is free to all take it and use it that's a permanent record you have in your own homes. So now to look at these defects, I'm going through certain books written by my op opponent. He has written so many books. I have 30 of those books with me. These are some of them, few of them, but I have 30 different books. All these are his publications. All these are his publications. He sells them and I bought them. One of them cost me two run in my country. It's just like two dollars. To me, it's like two dollars. I'm paying for these little, little things. For these little things. I pay two dollars each. Mine's so many more pages, bigger, free of charge. It's, it's in the service of Allah. Take it, use it. So, in his books, he makes mention of certain chapters and verses. Certain verses. Which are now not to be found in this Bible. They are not here in the Revised Standard Version. Why are they not here? We want to know. Why did you take out important things? The kingpin of Christianity. You see, the Christian missionary, when he goes anywhere in the world to preach, when he preaches, he can't help quoting John 3.16. The name of a book called John, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he sacrificed his only begotten son to wash away your sins, that whosoever believe, you be saved. John 3.16. No missionary can do without such a verse. Allah Baritala sacrificed his only begotten son. So I look for it here, John 3, 16. He said the word begotten is not there. They took it out. So why did they take it out? You know, the Muslims, we were supposed to object. Allah bari ta'ala in the Quran, as if he cries about this. In Surah Maryam, he says, وَقَالُوا تَخَزَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. 
in answer to that Allah says لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْءٍ عِدَّةً It's one of the most abominable assertion one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. To say that Allah begot a son. Because this is to attribute an animal nature. The lower animal functions of sex to Allah. That is like a man or an animal. Astaghfirullah. So Allah reacts strongly. He said, samawatu yatafattarna minhu. Edit the skies are ready to burst. Watan shakkal ardu. And the earth to split asunder. Watan khirru jibalu hadda. And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. And the awlir rahmani walada. That they should say that ar-Rahman, the merciful God has begotten a son. The worst swearing you want to give Allah, you want to swear him. This is the worst thing you can swear. Like the worst swearing I can give you. You just swear your mother. Anything else, you overlook. You will tolerate. If you have an argument with me, I'm an old man. And old people, they say, have a tendency to lose their tempers very quickly. That you know. So, in anger, I say, you are a fool. What will you do? You'll punch me? No, I says, old man. You know, I says, he's calling me a fool. I say, you know, you are an ox. You know, ox. You are an ox. What do you do? I say, you are a monkey. I say, you are a donkey. What do you say? You laugh it all. So, old people, you know, they have a tendency to talk, you know, strong language, strong in the condemnation. <laughs> like um, an old man, he went to the Hakim, the doctor, and he's complaining, he says, Dr. Saheb, you know, respected doctor, you know, I, my visibility is very, very poor. I can't see properly. So, the Hakim, the doctor says, well, this is a sign of old age. He says, you know, Dr. Saheb, my teeth, they're all shaky very loose. He said, that's a sign of old age. He said, no, Dr. Sahib, I can't hear properly. So the doctor says again, he says, look, it's a sign of old age. So the old man lost his temper and slapped him on the face. So this is also a sign of old age. <laughs> so you excuse me, you know, if I say harsh words. But if I swear your mother, he said, uncle, stop it now. I don't want to hear one more word from you. See, all the respect that I have for you will be gone. It's already gone. But you say it will be gone. Say, so don't talk about my mother. Don't talk about my daughter. Don't talk about my wife. Don't talk about my sister. Call me what you like. Am I right? Call me what you like. But leave my mother out of the picture. You're going to react strongly. Allah reacts. He says, this is what they're saying about me. That I begot a son. He says, if the heavens had emotions like you, had feelings like you, the heavens would have fallen. If the earth had feelings and emotions like you, the earth would have split asunder and the mountains would have fallen down in utter ruin. If they had feeling like you, they are inanimate. They have no life. But if they had life, feeling and emotions like you, this is what would have happened. Such a horrible thing that they are saying. Does that move the Muslims? Does it move you? Me? No. Nobody's moved. You know, it's like a big joke. When the Christian says that Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made, in his catechism. Jesus is the only begotten son. Not made. Not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig and donkey was made by God. Not like that. As such, he is a Rabbul Alameen. He is a Lord, cherisher, sustainer and evolver of the whole of mankind. Every creature. Everything. But no, not in that sense. Jesus is begotten, not made. So I'm asking the English speaking people, I said, what is to beget in your language? Will you please explain? What are you trying to emphasize? When you say begotten, not made, what are you really trying to tell me? And believe me, no Englishman with the name ever opens his mouth to tell me what it means because it's a horrible thing to explain. To say, begetting is an animal act. Is that what God Almighty did to Maryam? Is that what you're trying to tell me? He's begotten, not made. What are you trying to say? Horrible. No, no Englishman in my life yet has explained to me what he's trying to say, except an American. When I posed the question, I, in my meeting with him, I was guiding the fellow around the mosque as a guide, and somehow this discussion came about and I asked him, what does it mean? So he said, it means sired by God. That's a term you use in animal husbandry. You know, this horse sired that one and sired that one. You know, that's they use it in animal husbandry or the bull. This bull sired that one and sired that one. So it means the father of this and the father of that. The word sired is used in animal husbandry. So he said it means sired by God. I said, what? He said, no, no, no. You ask me what it means. So I'm telling you what it means. I don't say that. That God Almighty sired a son. I don't say that. But that's what it means. And that is what it means. 
So we Muslims for 1400 years, we are reading this in the Quran, we should have taken strong exception. We should have found these people out, start talking to them, asking them, say, what is this that you're talking about? Why are you swearing Allah bari ta'ala? No, 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 the Muslims didn't do anything. Nothing, they're satisfied. It's a big joke. <laughs> you see this guy, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Big joke. The Christians themselves now threw this word out from the Holy Bible, from the Holy Bible, that this is, was an interpolation. They had pushed it in, they had invented it, they had concocted it, they were thumb sucking it, they threw it out without any ceremony, no ceremony, they just threw it out. So I said, you see, if this was the word of God, if this is God's word, you have no right to alter or change. You took out the whole word, the most important word in the religion. This is, makes an exception of Jesus, he's not like anybody else. He is begotten by God. He is not made by God. Adam was made. This is begotten. Allah ka jana hua beta. They took it out. I said, we must take off our hats to the Christians. These learned men. You know, they are very good. If they can do that, they are honest. They are sincere. Can't you see? They know that this is a fabrication. So out it goes. Without ceremony, they took it out. Shouldn't we congratulate them? Shouldn't we? What Quran was telling us, Lam yalid wa lam yulad, is right, out it goes. They took it out. You are every Muslim child says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad. They took it out. I said, we must congratulate them. When you meet your Christian friends, call them. I said, look, thank you very much. You know, my Quran was protesting. The Muslim world ought to have protested, reasoned with you. We didn't do it. But thanks to your scholars, they saw that this was a fabrication and honesty demanded that they throw it out and they threw it out. This is now from Jimmy Swaggart's book. He quotes the verse with the word begotten. So I said, now look, it's not in my Bible. In other words, it is not the word of God. What you are quoting is not the word of God. Then I said, you start the book from the very beginning. The very beginning of the book starts with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You don't have to remember the names. These are supposed to be the books of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. The Torah. The Jews say Torah, we say Torah. Arabic Torah, Hebrew Torah. Torah means the law. So they say this is the word of God, Allah's revelation to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. The Torah, this is the Torah. We said, look. Let's see it. Let's have a look at it. So we look at it and I tell you that there are in these five books, like five surahs, in these five books, 700 times, 700 times, it says, the phrase is used, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, Lord means God Almighty, he said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, 700 times. In other words, 700 times you are being told that this is not the book of God and this is not the book of Moses. If Moses wrote those words, he would have said, the Lord said unto me and I said unto the Lord. If Allah wrote that or dictated it, he said, I said to Moses and Moses said unto me. I told Moses and Moses told me. So we know not only that Allah didn't write it, it's not only the book of Allah, it's not even the book of Moses. These five books. And these people, in the, in the extra information they give you at the end, the publishers, they tell you about these books. This is Genesis, the first book. Genesis means the beginning. Genesis, the first book of Moses in inverted commas. Exodus, the second book of Moses, second book of Moses in inverted commas. Leviticus, third book of Moses in inverted commas. Numbers, fourth book of Moses in inverted commas. Deuteronomy, fifth book of Moses in inverted commas. You know inverted commas? When you quote something and you put those commas, which goes to tell people that this is not what I say, this is what the other man said. Friend or foe, whether you agree or you don't agree with what is said, but these are not my words. They are put in inverted commas. In other words, they're telling you that look, 
This is not the book of Moses. This is not the book of Moses. This is what people say. This is what people like to hear. The people who buy the book. So we put it for you, book of Moses, but in inverted commas, which the bulk of people don't understand. What's the inverted commas for? This, the meaning is, that not our words. That's what people say. In other words, they're telling you, this is not the book of Moses. Leave out being the book of God. It's not even the book of Moses. Then in the last book, supposed to be that of Moses, Deuteronomy, chapter 34, it says, And there Moses died in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peer. He died. Can a man before dying say that I died? Is that how you talk? I can prophesy about myself. It might be proof false. That, you know, Ahmad Dida died in Washington, D.C. and Regan attended his funeral. Look, I'm here. I'm alive. I'm telling you, I died in Washington, D.C. I died. And Re maybe it can never be. I'll die in my own country. I like to die in my own country, among my own people. I like to be buried there. But I can say that I will, you know, I'm telling you that, you know, I heard some voices and telling me that I'm going to die there. And Regan is going to attend my funeral. Huh? Can you see? How can Moses say that I died? He died in the land of Moab and no one knows of his sepulchre and his grave unto this day. And, and Moses was, you understand English? This is past tense. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. Moses saying that? And his natural powers had not abated. Means if he married another 16 year old, he was fit enough, you know, to have a, a young wife. His natural powers had not abated. Then, he says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Did Moses say that? Since in Israel. Somebody else is talking. Can't you see? You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a DD, a doctor of religion to understand this. Simple, basic language, if you understand, what does it mean? It means Hazrat Musa alayhi salam didn't write these books. So as such, it's not only is not the book of God, but it's not even the book of Moses. Coming to the New Testament. Coming to the New Testament. In the King James Version. In some modern translations, they have omitted these words which I'm going to say now. But in the King James Version, which Brother Swaggart uses, this is the one he uses. And this is the one he sells. In his books, he's advertising this Bible, $25. And a little fancy, $50. You know, I, in my country, I'm offering this book here, the Holy Quran, with Arabic text, English translation, and commentary, 1,920 pages for 10 rands. That's $5. 10 rand, $5. And if you can't afford it, as it's free, just write and get it. Free. Every school, University, public library, absolutely free. Every mosque and madrasa, free. And if you can't afford it, free. Only thing I can't give you free is because I have to send it by air. That's going to kill me. That air alone will cost me about four or five times the amount of the value of the book, which I can't afford. But in my country, I says, come, take it. Take it. You can't afford it? You say you're earning 1,000 dirhams a month and you've got half a dozen children and you can't afford Take it. Free. Big business. Bible is big business. So, he advertises this book here, King James Version. And in the King James Version, the New Testament starts. First book, the first book is the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Second book, the Gospel according to St. Mark. Third book, the Gospel according to St. Luke. Fourth book, the Gospel according to St. John. I'm asking, what is this according to, according to, according to? Why according to? You, see, you don't get the joke. You just read the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. I said, what is this according? Why according to? This little publication, it says there, Ahmad did that. That's my book. I wrote it. I'm responsible. You can take me to task. If I have made some utterances here which are false, you can take me to task. Because this is my book. But if it was according to Ahmad did that, that means somebody else wrote it. Not me. You are telling that according, maybe it's not, it was not according to what I'm thinking, but you're attributing things to me. It could be a lie against me, but if I wrote it, I'm responsible. But if somebody attributes something to me, say, according to Mr. Didad, it could be false. 
So every book begins according to, according to, according to, because Matthew didn't sign his name, Mark didn't sign his name, Luke didn't sign his name, John didn't sign his name. These are not, these are anonymous books. Somebody had written. And they just say, well, I think this Matthew could have. You know, I think this is the work of Mark. I think, you know, it, is, it seems to fit, uh, fit Luke's mentality. I think you know, only John could have spoken like that. So according, according. The internal evidence also shows, like for example, that Matthew didn't write Matthew. Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. It says, while he, that is Jesus, was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a tax collector called Matthew. And he, Jesus, came up to him, Matthew, and said unto him, Matthew, follow me, Jesus. And he, Matthew, followed him, Jesus. I'm asking, did Jesus write that? Did Matthew write that? If Matthew wrote it, he said, while he was going forth into the way, he saw me collecting taxes at the tax collector's table. And he came up to me and said unto me, follow me, and I followed him. That's Matthew talking. But this is somebody writing in the third person. See, not the words of Jesus, not the words of Matthew. And one of the leading lights of the Christian world, J.B. Phillips, an Anglican, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, he translated the Gospels, the New Testament, into modern English. See, most of this English here is archaic, you know, old-fashioned. Thee and thou and thine. So he brought it down to this ordinary, usual level colloquial level the gospels into modern English and in his preface to the gospel he says early tradition ascribed this gospel to the apostle Matthew that's what people said that Matthew wrote the book but scholars nowadays almost all reject the view who scholars? Muslim scholars? Jewish scholars? Hindu scholars? no Christian scholars Christian scholars of the highest eminence they say that Matthew didn't write Matthew. Say the author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew. Conveniently. Because instead of saying the first book of the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 9, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 17, wasting my breath, wasting time in writing, wasting space, ink. He says, no. So I said, Matthew 9, 9. I said, Matthew 5, 17. Conveniently, I'm using the name, the term. See, the author, whom we may still conveniently call Matthew, has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q. Now, this Q is in inverted commas. It stands for the German word quella, means sources, some mysterious sources, which might have been a collection of oral traditions. He has used Mark's gospel freely. This man, who's supposed to be Matthew, has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, he has been copying wholesale from Mark. In the language of the school teacher, he's copying wholesale from Mark. And Mark was a 10-year-old boy when Jesus walked this earth. Can you imagine an eyewitness, a ear witness, a companion of Jesus? He goes and copies a 10-year-old boy who wasn't there. Does it make sense to you? If it was Matthew, would he go and copy somebody else and a child of 10? So therefore we know, not only that it is not the word of God, but it is not even the words of Matthew. Further quotations, those grave defects that we are talking about. The Holy Trinity is another topic as which, with which we are at variance. See, this word Trinity, Trinity, the Christian world believes in it. The Roman Catholics, the Protestants, they all believe in the Holy Trinity, in which they say the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but they are not three gods, but one God. The catechism, it continues, is that the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty, but they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, but they are not three persons, but one person. I am asking the English-speaking peoples, I say, I say, what language are you talking? That's not English. That's gibberish. Not even Greek, it's gibberish. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. 
What, what are you talking about? But you see, we are so odd. You know, we think the man knows his language. That's what you think. So you, you dare not ask him, what does it mean? How can it be person, 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 and not three person, but one person? How can that be? No, no, you dare not ask him because you think maybe in his language, he can justify it somehow. I tell you, there is not a Christian born with his DDs and whatever degrees who can justify person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I'm asking him, what is a person? In your language, sir, what is a person? I said, you and your two other brothers, are identical triplets. I can't make out the difference between the three of you. One of you commit murder, can we hang the other? According to your Christian law? He says, no. I said, why can't you? He said, no, he is a different person. That's the right meaning. He's a different person. I said, but I can't make out the difference. I said, look, whether you can or you can't. He is a different person. So, if your personality is different, you are different. You can't be the same. And in the mind, ask any Christian. When he says, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, he's got three distinct mental pictures. Father looks different, Son looks different, Holy Ghost looks different. I won't go into details. But my brother Jimmy Swaggart, he confirms that in his books, that there are three distinct persons, three distinct personalities, three different bodies, he says. And yet they are one. He goes a little further than the rest. It's three different bodies, and yet it's one. However, now the strongest support for this you know the word trinity is not to be found in any bible in the world the word trinity which is the bedrock of christianity is not to be found in any bible any version in the world can you imagine it the foundation like the kalima can you imagine allah is allah is wahdahullah sharik he is one and muhammad is messenger is not in the quran and yet you say we believe in it no it is in the quran but suppose it's not in the quran Allah is one, la ilaha illallah, there is no ilaha except Allah, and Muhammad is Rasulullah. If it is not in the Quran, and yet we believe in it, that's the foundation of our, our faith. His foundation is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Trinity, the word Trinity is not to be found in any Bible in the world. But amazing thing, it is in the Quran. Do you know that? The word Trinity is in the Quran. But it is a, a denial of it. It says, Allah says in the Quran, about Trinity, he says, Wala takulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. Don't say Trinity. In tahu khair lakum. This is, stop it, it'll be better for you. Inna Allah wa ilahum wahid. For your Allah is one Allah, is not three in one, is not one in three. The word Trinity is in the Quran, but it says, don't say that. The strongest support that the Christian has for Trinity is a verse which Brother Jimmy Swaggart, he quotes in his book, in his book called The Error of the Jesus Only Doctrine. It's another cult among the Christians. I didn't know about them until I read this. The Jesus Only Doctrine. In that he quotes the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, do shahada, in heaven, the Father, the word, word stands for Jesus, Kalima. Kalimatan. You know, Allah Bari Ta'ala gave his word upon Mary, bestowed upon Mary, Kalima. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Clear statement about the Trinity is there. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. This is funny, you know, it's not in my Bible. It is not in my Bible. It's not here. Why is it not there? So, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say this was another fabrication. This was another interpolation. This was another adulteration. So they threw it out without ceremony, not even a remark at the bottom to tell you what they have done. It's just out. It's not there. Look, you didn't do the job. We didn't do the job. We didn't tell the Christians, Walata Kulu Salasa. Nobody. As a matter of fact, some leading lights here, they're telling me, why are you telling all this to the Christians? Why don't you leave them alone? I don't want to take his name. I met him this morning. Very important person in your country. 
You say, what is all this Christian? No, you talk about Christianity, about the Bible, Bible, wasting time. Look at the Muslims, they're not perfect. <laughs> they're not, and they're not perfect. Wallah, we are not perfect. But I says, you know, you my brother, you Arab, he's Arab. I said, you read the Quran. I says, you know, one third of the Quran is addressed to Jews and Christians. Do you know that? One third of the Quran is addressed to Jews and Christians. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel. Who, you Bani Israel? You Ahl al-Kitab? He said, no, Jews and Christians. Are you Jews and Christians? No. Allah says, Wala taqulu salasa. Do you say Trinity? Do you? No. Who is he talking about? Whosoever says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God is making kufar, is an act of blasphemy, is a treason against Allah. But Christ said, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, La'budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Innahu man yushrik billah, whoever will associate anyone with Allah, Fakad harram Allah wa jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for them. Wa ma'abahu nar, and the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. Wa ma'aliz zalimina min ansar, and for the wrongdoers there will be no one to help. Do you say that Jesus is God? Do you? No. One third of the Quran is addressed to Jews and Christians. So I said, you know you? He's an Arab. With apologies to my other Arab brothers. He's an Arab. I said, you know, all these verses must be taken out from the Quran and put into a museum. Don't you agree? If these are not to be used, then put it in a museum. Why are you making our Hafiz and Qaris and everybody to waste their time reading it when it's not supposed to be used? Allah wants you to use it. He's crying, he's protesting, and you have done nothing. We have done nothing. Now if somebody comes along trying to do, <laughs> putting up a little act, <laughs> may Allah accept this, you know, to say, look, my brothers, this is what it is. Look, I'm showing it to you. I said, look, this is how easy it is to use it. It's there. They are giving the ammunition to you. Use it. So, without we protesting, we should have said, Wala taqulu salasa, deliver the message to the West. Nothing doing. We didn't do it. We couldn't do it among the Arabs ourselves. Six million Coptic Christians in Egypt, they say salasa. Did you tell them, Wala taqulu salasa? They say that Jesus is God. Did you tell them, Lakat kafar al-lazina kalu inna Allah wal masyib Maryam? Did you tell them, Wama kataluhu wama salabu? No, you're not doing it. They are doing it for you. They took it out, this was on the Trinity, they threw it out as an interpolation, adulteration, fabrication. Shouldn't we take off our hat to them? Shouldn't we? Great man. So I said, look, if this was the word of God, you couldn't have thrown it out. God would have protected his book as he tells us, promises us in the Holy Quran. Say, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. This is his promise and he has done the job. He's protected his book. Here, everyone, seven books thrown out. Here, chunks and chunks are being thrown out. By who? By themselves. It is for us to take this up congratulate them and bring them towards Islam. They are coming towards Islam, but they are dragging their feet. Encourage them. They are dragging their feet like cripples. I said, no, 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 brother, come. Ahlan wa sahlan. We are very good at that. We did it to the Jews for a thousand years. You know that? When there were pogroms against the Jews in Europe, in Poland, Germany, France, England, they were killing the Jews, murdering and raping their women and burning their homes. Every Easter, the Christians reminded themselves that these are Christ killers. They kill our God and they kill them. Burn their homes and rape their women. And they ran, and they ran, and they come to Muslim lands, and the Muslims say, Ahlan wa Sahlan. Come, most beautiful words of welcome. Ahlan wa Sahlan. And they came, and they lived with us for a thousand years. And in a thousand years, we didn't convert a thousand Jewish families to Islam. This is how good we are. Why? Uh, they are following Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. They are the, you know, uh, they are the Ahl al-Kitab. Allah is telling you, tell them, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Talaw. No, no. You didn't do that. He said, let us remain the status quo. No, don't disturb them. Your cousins. So now, this is what you are paying for now. Neglect! 1,000 years! You have the opportunity to talk to the Jews. You could have absorbed them. In the marriage, this that there, there wouldn't be any Jews to be found anyway. In the Middle East at least. No, you didn't do that. You kept them where they are. So now you pay the price. This is the revenge. As if Allah is taking on you. You didn't do it. So now look, I make them to sit on your head. 
يستبدل قوما غيركم says you substitute in your place another people ثم لا يكون وامثالكم then they won't be like you there are things in the book stories and stories our brother swagat he writes beautiful books his works are very powerful books pornography books solomon gomora komilut his book incest his book alcohol america's greatest problem his book homosexuality its cause and its cure very powerful books if you have access to them if you can buy them as a buy them good very good work he in these books is talking like a muslim his condemnation of evil is like a, that of a muslim maybe he doesn't go far enough his theology is wrong but his ethics and morality on these topics i can improve on it i can improve on that his ethics and morality is good he tantalizes people he mesmerizes people people can eat out of his hand like you call a dog a puppy and the dog comes along and licks your hand and ch- eats away what is in your hand he can do that to you the master of speech allah has given it to him but he is using it wrong theology i can so now this is what you are paying for now neglect 1000 years you had the opportunity to talk to the jews you could have absorbed them intermarried this that there would there would be any jews to be found anyway in the middle east at least no you didn't do that you kept them where they are so now you pay the price this is the revenge as if allah is taking on his life you didn't do it so now look i make them to sit on your head just tabdil qauman ghayrakum says you substitute in your place another people thumma la yakun amsalakum then they won't be like you there are things in the book stories and stories our brother swagat he writes beautiful books his works are very powerful books pornography books solomon gomora komilut his book incest his book alcohol america's greatest problem his book homosexuality its cause and its cure very powerful books if you have access to them if you can buy them as a buy them good very good work he in these books is talking like a muslim his condemnation of evil is like a, that of a muslim maybe he doesn't go far enough his theology is wrong but his ethics and morality on these topics i can improve on it i can improve on that his ethics and morality is good he tantalizes people he mesmerizes people people can eat out of his hand like you call a dog a puppy and the dog comes along and licks your hand and ch- eats away what is in your hand he can do that to you the master of speech allah has given it to him but he is using it wrong theology i can't deal with everything but let me give you a little cursory glance at some of these things incest incest he said the dark stain on our society american society he says in the book he says incest has reached epidemic proportions it's like an epidemic in america you know what is incest anybody who doesn't know what is incest please put up your hand don't be ashamed if you don't know then i have to explain if you all know then i can carry on if you don't know what incest is please put up your hands yes jazakallah you see adultery fornication is you go along out of marriage with somebody else's wife or daughter that's zina but if you go and have relationship with your own mother that is incest you have it with your own daughter that's incest you have it with your sister is incest if you have it with your daughter in law is incest now you know everybody knows now what incest is you have it somebody else's wife or daughter out of wedlock that is zina adultery you have it with your mother with your <laughs> with your daughter with your daughter in law with your sister that sex relationship that is incest and in the holy bible in this holy book of god in inverted commas i hope now you understand the meaning of inverted commas in this holy book of god there are 10 cases of incest 10 ten different couplings of this cases in the holy book of god so what's the purpose in the first book of the bible there are five cases of incest five couplings in the first book 
of the Bible, Genesis, there are five different incest cases. That book is a booklet. And in that booklet, the first book, it's five cases of incest. As if it is a textbook on incest. If you didn't know what were types of incest you can commit, you read the first book and it'll tell you, you can do it with your daughters, you can do it with your mother, you can do it with your daughter-in-law, you can do it with your sisters. It'll tell you. This is the book. The book of God. I said in inverted commas. I knew four cases. My own study. I get this little book, he gives me ten. But the four cases, he gives me one more, which I didn't see in the first book. Four I knew, he gives me one more. He is my teacher. He taught me that. There's one extra case of incest which I didn't know. It speaks there about Lut alayhi salam. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes and lives in a cave, says the Bible, in a place called Zor, him and his two daughters. And the eldest daughter tells the younger that our father is old. You know, he's gone cold. And there's not another man on earth who can come in unto us in the manner of men. You know how what men do? That, there's nobody else to do that to us. So come, let us make our father drink wine. I'm only reading the Bible, the Holy Bible, word for word. If anybody has it, open it and see, word for word. Say, our father is old, and there is not another man on earth who can come into us in the manner of men. So come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him so that we may preserve the seed of our father. They want to preserve the father's seed. And the eldest daughter makes the father drink wine, and she goes and lies with him, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. He didn't know. He was too dead drunk, says the Bible. Then, next night, the elder daughter tells this, her sister, he said, look, yesterday night, means last night, I slept with my father. Tonight you do the same. So they repeated the performance. And thus, just like that, Dalika, just like that, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. Incest, children of incest. And the firstborn gave birth to a son, and they named him Moab. And the other one gave birth to a son, and they called his name Ammon, from which we get the Ammonites and the Moabites. In the Bible, Ammonites and the Moabites. When the children of Israel, when they were in the Sinai, and when they were told to go and conquer Palestine, they were told, go and kill the Palestinians, men, women, and children. Even sucklings are not to be spared. Little babies sucking the mother's breast not to be spared. Kill them all. But the children, the Ammonites and the Moabites, thou shalt not touch, because they are the children of Lord. Blessed. Father having relationship with his daughters, those children are blessed. But you Palestinians, you Arabs, rubbish, kill them all. This merciful God is telling the Jews, kill them all, men, women, and children. Only, and not even sucklings, but he's more merciful some other time. In the book, in the book of Numbers, chapter 31, verse 31, he's more merciful to the Palestinians. Now he says, Kill them all, men, women, and children, even donkeys are not to be spared. Kill the donkeys even. I said, what sin did the donkeys commit? That this God of mercy wants to kill even donkeys. What have they done? But kill even the donkeys. But virgins, you must save for yourself. Women which no man has known and had no sexual experience. That woman you must save for yourself. And they saved for themselves, says the holy book, in inverted commas. 32,000 Palestinian virgins for themselves. And 30 and 2 was for the Lord. Lord means God. 32 was his share, God's share, out of those virgins, Palestinian virgins. I'm asking, what does the Lord do with virgins? What does he do? You tell me, what does the Lord do with virgins? Except in the name of the Lord, the priest will enjoy them. And how do you know that the woman is a virgin? A soldier in the field, he comes across a young woman. How does he verify? I leave it to your imagination. You say, Book of God, 10 cases of incest, and every incest case that I can quote you, blessed, blessed, blessed. They're blessed. You see, we tell stories to our children, fables, fairy tales, you know, imagination. Fox and the grapes. You know the story? The fox, he sees a, a vine of grapes, a bunch of grapes hanging, and he jumps, wants to get grapes. You know, foxes don't go for grapes, you know that. You know that. Foxes don't, but this is a fable. Fable. 
So he jumps and jumps, and every time he jumps, he's losing his energy, and he can't reach it, so, and he's fed up. The fox is fed up, so he says, look, sour grapes. <laughs> we all do that. You know that? When you can't get a thing, you say, oh, it's no good, it's rubbish, sour grapes. So we are telling our children these fables to build a moral, a lesson. Don't be like that greedy fox. When you can't get a thing, it's bad, it's for sour. Or like that greedy dog, he found a bone. He picks up the bone in his mouth and he's crossing a wooden, wooden bridge over a, over a river and he sees his own reflection in the water. Thinking that there is another dog with a bone in his mouth and he's greedy for the other dog's bone, so he's a boom, and he loses what he has. So he says, my son, don't be like that. What God gave you, little bit, la in shakartum la azidannakum. He says, be grateful, Allah will give you more. Don't be greedy for the other dog's bone. Morals, morals. We're telling fairy tales to build morals in our children. Without morals, the thing is immoral. If there's no moral, you're wasting time. Dr. Vernon Jones, an American psychologist of great repute. You know, the Americans are great. I tell you, I can quote Americans, what, what they say, beautiful things. An American psychologist of great repute, he carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories were being read. And he says, his conclusion, that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation. The type of stories you tell creates the type of mentality that they have. It's a foregone thing. You tell your children about jinn boot, jinn boot, you know, spirits. You know, you go outside, there's something, they'll catch you. Shh, you see your child, how it behaves. Darkness, they can't go out. Even with a torch, won't go out. Why not? Because you talk about jinn, boot, jinn, boot, you know. So these spirits, I don't know, say, roo, roo, what do you call it? Spooks, you know, spook. I don't know what you say in Arabic. But spook, spook, you keep on telling your children about spook, 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 they become spooky. So whatever you tell them, incest, 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 little wonder that it has reached epidemic proportions in America. And in my country, 8% of all white people, they commit incest with their own daughters. One in every 12 is cohabiting with his own daughters. These are the living fathers. In America, shh, maybe that percent or more. So, is the type of stories that you read will create the type of mentality that you have. You keep on reading incest, 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 you're going to commit incest. It is not the book of God. Book of God, for what reason, is telling you about 10 cases of incest, you tell me. What's the motive? What's the reason? God to tell you about Lord did it to his daughter. That's what the Bible says. Reuben, he did it to his mother. Judah, the father of the Jewish, he did it with his daughter-in-law. Ibrahim alayhi salam, astaghfirullah, he did it with his sister. And on and on and on. For what reason? No reason. No morals. I say immoral. Can't be the book of God. Alcohol. Very strong condemnation. He tells us, gives us figures here. He says there are 11 million drunkards in America. In my country they call them alcoholics. They don't say drunkard. Drunkard is an insulting term, especially the white man. You can't say he's a drunkard. You say he's an alcoholic, meaning he's sick, poor fellow. This is a kind of sickness he's got. 11 million drunkards, he says, and 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, and I agree, we'll have to agree with him. He said, I make no difference between the alcoholics, and the drunkards, and the heavy drinkers. To him, they are the same. In Islam, we'll say, same. I say, one step further, even your social drinkers. Islam will include even your social drinkers. See, those are not just a nip or a thought. Because our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, so whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a thought. He said, cursed is he who grows grapes for brewing. If your intention is that from this fruit, you're going to brew, make wine, alcohol, you are an accursed person. If you plant fruit trees for eating the fruit, you are blessed. For selling the fruit, you are blessed. But if you plant it with the idea of brewing it, you are an accursed person. He said, cursed is he who grows great for brewing. Cursed is he who crushes it. Cursed is he who bottles it. Cursed is he who sells it. And cursed is he who drinks it. No excuse for the Muslim to have any dealing with this stuff. Islam has the answer. Islam is the answer to your problems. You talk about don't drink too much, when does the guy know when he has reached too much? When he already starts taking? When? 
you got now 55 million, 11 million drunkards and 44 million heavy drinkers and others in the line, in the queue. They are following the same way, whom you call your social drinkers. Islam has the answer. It's the only religion, it's the only religious book on the face of the earth, the Quran, which says, don't touch that filthy, dirty thing. Ya ayyuhallazina amanu. It says, oh you who believe, innam alhamru, most certainly intoxicants, wal maisiru and gambling, wal ansabu and fortune telling, wal azlamu and idol worship, rizum min amal shaitan, are an abomination of Satan's handiwork, fachtani buhul Allah kum tuflihun. Shun such abomination that he may prosper. The only religious book on the face of the earth which says don't touch that stuff is, is the Quran. And Islam teaches don't touch it. The solution to the problem, become Muslims. And I end, my dear brothers and sisters. I know, I know there's so much here. I know what I'm going to do there. You see, I'm supposed to speak for an hour and my opponent speak for an hour. Now I get the news that he's got cold feet. He's talking about 20 minutes. Can you imagine speaking for 20 minutes on 66 books? The foundation of his faith, the Holy Bible, he's going to speak for 20 minutes and he's now want to gag me also for 20 minutes. Control me, straight jacket me for 20 minutes. This book, 20 minutes? I don't know what's going to happen, but we are going through with it, inshallah. We will press. The condition of the contract was when I left South Africa, speak for an hour each. Now when I'm here, I get the news the guy's gone down to 20 minutes. And maybe, like a school children, you know, he wants to have a school children's debate. You have 20,000 people that come from hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, and he says for 20 minutes, listen to Swagat, and 20 minutes, listen to Didat. I'll end with this. He hasn't written a book yet. Out of the 30, one of the pressing problems of America is surplus women. Surplus women. In America today, there are 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, if there will still be 7.8 million women who can't get husbands, if they married. In the city of New York alone, there are 1 million more women than men. 1 million, you know, more women than men. And they are hunting for men. They are doing the hunting now. Not men. And men are hiding. One third of them are gays, sodomites, Qawmelut. One third. With a million extra women, one third of your population is gay, sodomites, Qawmelut. And 98% of your prison population is men. And men get cold feet for so many different reasons. You know that? Some of the my young men I come across, hey, why don't, are you married? He says, no. I say, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? He says, no, no, no. I say, come on. I take you Mr. So-and-so's daughter, you know, it's very good. I says, all right. And I take him and everything is getting ready. Preparation is that they agreed. And this guy gets cold feet. Men get cold feet for so many different reasons. You, may, you want me to give you details? Men get cold feet. You know, they get frightened. They want to marry and they back out. You know that? They say, yes, yes, I want to marry. And then he backs out like a woman. Chickens out. So chickens out. Men. So can you imagine the problem? If every man got married, there will still be 7.8 million. With one third of your population is gay, sodomized, form loot, your problem. Can you imagine? They're literally going to the dogs. I'm telling my Arab brethren, all right, it might sound like a joke, but many serious things are said in jest, jokingly. I can pass it on to you. You'll take it. I hope my sisters don't mind. If they mind, don't curse me. You know, you can say, that is a bad fellow, but don't curse me. I'm telling my Arab brother, your countries are sparsely populated, hardly. Saudi Arabia, such a vast expanse, such riches, and no manpower. With all the manpower you're importing, still not enough. Same thing to your UAE, no manpower. I says, why don't you go to, instead of going to Bombay and Beirut, and France and London, Paris and London, why don't you go to New York? and solve the Americans' problem. I tell you, Wallah, they love you for it. Each of you bring four for each. And it's cheap, Wallah, four for each. And increase the Ummah. You can't do propagation, you can't do Dawah, do procreation. You'll be increasing the Ummah. You know, get pleasure and increase the Ummah. Do it that way. You solve the problem and you solve your problem. We need more population and they have to get rid of the surplus women. Solve the problem, solve yours. And they'll bless you for it. So, <laughs> Mr. Chairman is not here. <laughs>
ladies and gentlemen, uh, with these words, uh, I now leave this meeting open to questions. Maybe there are a lot of things that you want to know about this topic of the Bible or about any other thing relating to Islam and Christianity. I am your servant. I am at your disposal. I need your prayers. In this, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given me knowledge. Knowledge enough, inshallah, to, to knock the Jalut's brain. Allah has given me that knowledge. What I need is your dua, your prayer. That may Allah bari ta'ala, you know, keep me going for a little while longer that I can serve Islam. And that I may share with you, you know, some of these little knowledge that I have acquired, that you may also in turn go and serve the Deenul Islam. Wa akhirud da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Yes, yes. No, I'll stand up. Yes. I'll stand up. They can ask a question. Uh, shukran to the Islamic Kabir, Mr. Ahmed Didat, and I'm going to ask you for the answers and the questions for a period of time. I'm going to ask you for Is the mic here? Or they can ask? There's no mic? No mic? Is there? They'll give you a mic. If not, if there's difficulty, I can relay the question to the audience. It's not a question. It's a word I would like to say, and I would like to say it in English, because it's meant for you, Brother Ahmad Didat. It's about Jimmy Swaggart. For those who haven't seen him before, it's difficult to form an opinion about how he acts, how he behaves. I believe after seeing him once in the United States, that if the Jews have paid $1,000 million to form such a person, to say only what he said in one lecture, they would have been well paid يعني لو اليهود دفعوا ألف دولار ألف مليون دولار مشان يهيئوا شخص مثل هذا اللي ما قاله في محاضرة واحدة لا أخذوا التمام تمام I was in the States as a guest of American company and every evening they would come take us for dinner outside one evening I was in the hotel and they opened the television there was Jimmy Swagger there and he was, you stood here and you said you lectured, but I didn't see you move one meter here or a meter there. He was carrying the microphone, moving like a comedian or uh, a dramatic actor, bowing himself here, making his hair like that. And he was talking about 11 stars. And that actually what uh, made me keep on watching. And he spent about 15 minutes praising those 11 stars, trying to convince people that they were the most blessed, most loved by God. Of course, he meant the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel. And at the end of his lecture, he said that any person or any country or any regime that oppose the uh, sons of these people uh, will not live happily and he will be destructed. And he gave example. He said, look at Farud. Look at Nebuchadnezzar, Nasser, what happened to him. Look at the Roman Empire. Look at the Ottoman Empire. And he said in his words, he said, look at the Great Britain. She was the greatest country on earth. Now she is an isle in the sea. And unless they regret what they have done to the Jew for not delivering all Palestine to them before leaving, they will be, become like a fisherman village. And he said, you Americans, if you ever let go your help and your assistant to Israel, you Americans will become like what other people have come. Now he was like a person dancing on rope. And all it needed was a man to tickle the rope only to make him fall down. But unfortunately, it wasn't attainable. It wasn't possible at all. Because everybody is going to die. The Roman Empire, of course, vanished. 
the Ottoman Empire vanished like every, every, every nation in the past. They themselves, they had kingdom in Palestine, it went away. So it wasn't an excuse, it wasn't a proof that these people opposed them. And again, I was sorry that nobody could tell him about his lies. But God wanted me to give me that chance. And next evening, there were 15 people on the table. Some of the people who were talking about Jim Swaggart last night lecture. I pretended to be having my dinner quiet. My friend, he noticed I was the only foreigner. He said, we are talking about somebody who gave a lecture about Christianity. I said, is it Jimmy Swaggart? With loud voice. Everybody listened. The 15 people listened. He said, yes, did you see that? I said, yes, I saw it. But he was talking about 11 stars. Who are they? He said, the sons of Jacob. I said, aren't they the people who plotted and tried to kill their brother? He said, yes. I said, you call them plotters and murderers because they have committed the murder, although they did not succeed in killing their brother, they committed that. They are murderers, they are plotters. And then they went to their old father and lied to him and told him that your son was eaten by the wolf. So they are liars. Now this Jim Swaggart, I want to know why he is praising such people. Plotters, murderers, and liars. And the, the, incest. Their, beginning, their beginning was like that. Everybody listened. No, it appears to me the Americans need some, need some action on higher level than is now, not on individual person to go there and lecture. It needs, because their, their propaganda, the Jewish propaganda in the States, they will spend 10 years, 15 years to build up a person like this just to say one word, and then it's finished. I wish you the best of luck. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah kum ma'ak, and I'm sure God will bring you back victorious on, on your Inshallah. enemy. Shukr. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Any other questions? Come on, please. Oh, there's this. Mr. Dita, at this topic I've been handled here about the Bible being God's word or not. I believe somewhere in Quran it says something about Injil and Torah. If it is, just to clear my uh, understanding, if it is said in Quran, could you just explain a little bit which book is Injil and which book is Quran? Thank you. I'm very happy with the question. It gives me an opportunity to explain. Uh, usually, when I'm delivering a talk on the subject, I do explain all that beforehand. But since the subject has grown, and since I'm going to deal specially with my, our friend Jimmy Swaggart on the other side, I was trying to curtail myself with regards to this topic itself. Now, we Muslims are made to believe in four heavenly books. We believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Holy Quran. In these four heavenly books, we must attest our belief. Otherwise, we are not Muslims. Now, when we say Torah, what is Torah? We must know what is this Torah, what is this Zabur, what is this Injil? The bulk of our people, unfortunately, they don't know. So they caught up, they get caught up with this Christian missionary, uh, you know, terminology. They get caught up in their own web. For example, the lectures that I deliver, sometimes they say, look, a lot of our Arab brethren here, they don't understand English. So it should be translated. And the best of translators so far, when I say what the Bible says about Muhammad, the translator says what the Torah says about Muhammad in Arabic. I can understand when he's speaking Torah and he says about Muhammad. I'm interjecting. I said, look, I didn't say Torah. So he said, what the Injil says about... I said, I didn't say Injil. What's wrong with you? I said Bible and you say Torah. I say Bible and you say Injil. The Bible is not the Torah, it's not the Injil. This Bible is written by 40 different persons, supposed to be. 
66 books written by 40 different authors. So, Taurat? What is Taurat? We believe is the revelation, the wahi that Allah Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Musa It was from Allah and we believe in that revelation that it was true and from Allah, true guidance from God. Injil is the revelation, the wahi that Allah Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Isa We believe that that revelation was from Allah and it was true. We believe that the revelation wahi that Allah Ta'ala gave to Hazrat Dawud is the Zabur. But where are these revelations? Ask the Christians. Look, I told you that the Christians themselves say that Musa didn't write these five books. Why must you say it's the Torah? When he said this is the Torah, I said, look, your own authors are telling us the internal evidence shows that Musa Islam didn't write it. He didn't write his own obituary about his own death. You know, obituary, writing things on, the, on your tombstone. You know, what a great guy Ahmad Didat is. Do people, prophets of Bani Israel, they write their own obituaries about, about the death that I died when he's still alive. And I'm a man, I can marry a young woman of 12 or 16. Did he say that? Did he say nobody like me has a yet come yet? Yet? No. So the, 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 the books themselves bear testimony that Hazrat Musa Islam didn't write these books. But we believe that whatever was given to Hazrat Musa Islam was from Allah. He would have no reason to write in his Torah five different cases of incest. What reason? A man of God has got nothing else to do? Writing incest about Lut salam? What for? For what benefit? Why would he write this? That Hazrat Lut salam, a brother in prophethood, he committed incest with his daughters. And Reuben, one of his leaders, one of the, uh, our brother said just now about those 11 stars, one of those stars committed incest with his mother. The other star, the star, the other star, he committed incest with his daughter-in-law by the roadside, Judah. This is the record. Committers of incest, liars, murderers. Look, Astaghfirullah, I don't believe that. Except what the Quran says, that they did plot against Yusuf a.s. And they did throw him into the well. And they wanted to destroy him. And then they wanted, later on, they wanted to sell him also. And they lied to the father. All that, I accept what Allah says. But committing incest with his daughter-in-law, this, what, for what purpose? Were you going to say that Musa a.s. wrote that? Hazrat Musa a.s.? No. We say, Taurat is the revelation which God gave to Moses. If you can produce that, we would be prepared to give it a look. Injil is the revelation that Allah gave to Hazrat Isa a.s. And we read, now the Christians, when they translate the Bible into Arabic, they tell you, Injile Matthew. It means Injil of Matthew. Injile Marcus. Injile Lucas. Injile Johanna. I am asking, where is Injile Isa? We are made to believe in Injile Isa, the one that came to Isa, not Matthew, Marcus, Lucas, Johannes, Johannes. Can you see? But you are so blind, so foolish, you say, well, this Injil, Injil. This is not Injil. The Bible says that he went to a certain place, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, and he preached the Injil. He went to another place and he preached the Injil. He went to another place and he preached the Injil. I said, right? Did he carry a book under his arm? Injil, which he was opening and reading from? No. Is that message which he gave was the Injil. If you can produce that with his signature, we Muslims are bound to accept it as the word of God. We are bound. You can produce something written by Hazrat Musa a.s. with the signature, and so we are bound to accept that this is the Torah that Hazrat Musa a.s. left. But it isn't. You yourself say it is it not. Even Matthew didn't write Matthew. Is the Injil and Matthew is not even his Injil. So what? So is the principle. Remember this. Is the principle we accept that the revelation that was given was from Allah and it was true. But they have not preserved it. Therefore Allah sends another revelation to supersede what is there. So is the principle we believe in not in a book in a form. Whether written on stone or in book form on paper. It's not the book. It's the message is the Torah, the message is the Injil, the message is the Zabur, not the books that they are purveying today.
and uh, you used Bible to prove that Ahmad was coming in Bible, you said. And there is a debate on saying Bible. You are going to prove that it's wrong. So are not you contradicting your own statement? Yes. Uh, the question is that we are going to use certain, like last night, I used verses from the New Testament from which I proved that the, our Nabi Kareem sallallahu is still mentioned in their book. It's still there. In the corrupted book as it is, it's still there. So now if I use a verse from the Bible, does that, do I not contradict myself? One stage I say, this is not the book of God, and the other stage I use it to prove my case. You see, the Bible, we say, have four different types of evidences in the book. Four different types. In the Bible, if you study it, you'll find there is a word of God. is there. Allah's kalam is there. The word of the prophet is there. The word of the historian is there. And many other things besides is there. I was showing you. There are four different types of evidence in the Bible. And it doesn't need a super brain, a mastermind, you know, a DD or a theologian to see that. Simple, basic, you can see it. Like, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, you read something there. It says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. I will raise them up a prophet. Who is this I? The Jew will tell you God. Who is this I? The Christian says is God. The Muslim, if you read it, you can also see it's Allah talking. This is not the word of Moses. This is not the word of a historian. This is the word of God. I, says, أُقِيمُ لَهُمْ نَبِيًّا مِّن وَسَطِ إِخْوَتِهِمْ مِسْلَكَ وَأَجْعَلُ كَلَامِ فِي فَمِهِ فَيَكَلَّمَهُمْ بِكُلِّ مَا أُسِيهِ بِهِ This is, who's talking? It's a God is talking. You can see it on the very face of it. Another place in the book of Isaiah, in the Bible, it says, I, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Who's talking? Allah Bari Ta'ala. Speaking through this prophet called Isaiah, he's speaking about himself. These are the words coming from the lips of Isaiah, but they are not his words. These are the words of God. He's speaking as a mouthpiece. So there is this type of evidence which you will be able to recognize in the Bible. Then you will also find another type of evidence where the prophet of God is speaking. Like Jesus, he says, he says it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, had committed adultery with her already in his heart. But I say unto you, who is this I? Jesus. It has been said by them of old time, that whosoever puts away his wife, let him give her a bill of divorcement. But I say unto you, whosoever puts away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. Who is this I? Jesus. It has been said by them of old time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. Who is this I? Jesus. There's another type of evidence. Shahada. Then there is another type of evidence which says while he was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, he was going forth into the way, he, Jesus, saw a fig tree in the distance with leaves. Happily, he, Jesus, came up to it, wanting to find figs thereon. But when he came up to it, he found nothing but leaves. He found nothing but leaves. Jesus found nothing, for the season was not yet. Who is this talking now? Not Jesus, not God, but an eyewitness or a ear witness or somebody speaking from hearsay, a historian. See, another type of evidence. Then there is the other type of evidence, which I dare not read it to you. From the book of Ezekiel, my South African Christian government, they banned extracts from the Bible as filthy, dirty pornography. I didn't have a chance to deal with it. Pornography. So now, you have the word of God, you have the word of the prophet, you have the word of the historian, and you have pornography, all in one book. Now, you can't take the book and say, this is the book of God. But the word of God is there, the word of the prophet is there, the word of the historian is there, and pornography is there. Now we also have something similar. In Islam, we have Kalamullah, the word of Allah, the Quran. It is only Allah's Kalam. Then we have the books of Hadith, words of the prophet, separate volume. 
Then we have the words of our historian, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Ghazal, Ibn, uh, uh, Imam Ghazal, and on and on. Our historians, good, up, great men, separate books. Quran, separate volume. Hadith, separate volume. Historian, separate volume. And we had, long before Islam, the Arabs, you know, around the campfire, who was talking filthy, dirty stories to pass his night. What do you call the Arabian nights? You have that too, but it's a different volume. See, the Quran is different. Separate compartment. Hadith separate, history separate, pornography separate. They have everything in one book. And now they want to push the whole book down your throat, say this is the word of God. So we say no, this is not the word of God, but the word of God is there. So you use in any human uh, discussion, debate, argument, uh, differences, you have a case. You have a case against your brother. And he testifies against you in the court of law. Your lawyer is going to pick up from his evidence certain statements and he's going to take them to prove to the judge that the guy is lying, lying, lying. And he proves his case by taking your evidence, your opponent's evidence. You only take what is favorable to you. You don't swallow everything he said. But that what you think is favorable. You use that and he says, now look, your honor, I said I want absolution with costs means I want to be absolved from the charge and he must pay all the costs. And you will get judgment if you can prove to the judge that the guy is lying, lying, lying. Now the guy can say, but you know, you accept this word of mine, what about that? No, it doesn't work that way. If I can, whatever you said from your words, your speech, your testimony, I can prove my case, I use that. The others, shh, you throw it aside, one side. So this is how all human efforts work, all human discussions, dialogues work. And that is exactly what we are doing. Here you say, now you said, and then, I said, look, you are now taking it out. We protested about Trinity. The Quran protested. He said, look, but it's in the book. You must accept it. He said, now look, here, now you are recognizing your mistake. You threw it out. So thank you. About the begotten son, you threw it out. About the ascension, you threw it out. Look, this is so many things. But now I said, you are throwing it out. So in other words, now I still have to agree with you. You were at one time there, we disagreed. Now we agree with you that it shouldn't be there. Just because now one thing is right, then the other thing, Trinity, we suppose it was not taken out. You want us to swallow that too? I said, no, this is the fabrication. This is the fabrication. This is the fabrication. Where is the fabrication? Is the fabrication. Where we confirm, we confirm. Allah tells us in the Quran, He said, this has come to confirm the previous revelation and to preserve, to protect it from any type of change. The Quran is an, a touchstone of finding out what is right and what is wrong. I hope that satisfies the question, yes. Yes, we'll say now two more questions. One, so then they will know, otherwise they can get on to the online. So just like the, as the Muslims believe that uh, Quran is a revelation to Prophet Muhammad is uh, are the Christians believing that Bible is also a revelation to Prophet Jesus? And if as the Quran is preserved in the language Arabic, is the Bible preserved in the original language of Jesus Christ? Can you please be on And if so, why? Our friend, brother Jimmy Swagar and others, missionary, Christian missionaries, why don't they produce the original Bible or Injil and side by side the translations, whether in English or other languages? And as the Muslims, all Muslims, whether they know Arabic or not, they study Quran in Arabic, and those who do not understand read translations. Are the Christians also doing this, or why don't they do it? Could you kindly clarify and request also Mr. Jimmy Swagar with all the money he has got? Yes. No, Jesus Christ, there's nothing preserved in his original tongue. All the gospel manuscripts they have, they're boasting about 24,000 manuscripts. Not one is written in his mother tongue. For what reason? That a Jewish prophet comes to Jews speaking the Jewish language, of which they gave samples, examples in the book that he spoke Jewish, like the word Salisa Kumi, damsel arise, Ella Ella Lama Sabachthani, and to Saul, Paul, he speaks in the Hebrew language, the Bible says so, he spoke to him in the Hebrew language, then why should his words be not preserved in Hebrew? 
is a mystery which the Christians must solve, not for us. The fact is, it is not there. Jesus didn't write a word. In his lifetime, not a word was written. He didn't ask anybody to write anything. This is how good it is. So that is the answer. And I will give one more chance, one more questioner, and we will have to close the meeting after that. One more questioner, whoever it is. Yes, Akhi, you can come forward and you can ask the question. The last questioner. Or last two. The other brother had got up before and he went and sat down. Last two. I hope you don't mind. The audience. Last two. It is really not a question. It's part of an answer of this gentleman what we just asked. Yes. In Baptist, West Bank of Jordan, there is a tribe of Jews called the Selectors, Subhana. And they say that they have the oldest Torah uh, with them. And it's written on a letter of a uh, Ghazal, a deal. Uh, I was, that's the one who told me, he's a priest of them. And he told me this has been written after uh, Moses died with 13 years. So I said, okay, I believe you. But what you have changed? What you had and what you did not? He said, I was in that. We never did that. So I told him, your great, great father, Saturday, he made a book that he worship when Moses was alive. And then how did he not change the Bible? He says, no, that book, not the Samaritan who did it, Hero, who did that, collect all the gold, the throne, the fire, the pendant, came upon. He said, oh, you still lie, it's your prophets. So that's probably really, maybe it's possibly the uh, oldest. Uh, what they call it, uh, it's written by all, all people. Thank you for the contribution. <laughs> yes, Akhibillah. This is the last question. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Suzai wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's more than a pleasure to see this beautiful face once more in the Emirates. In fact, I don't find enough words to describe my pleasure seeing him again. And I do believe even in his absence he is with us, then so many of us do have see, do see him in the video cassettes and do listen to him in the audio cassettes. This man has a mission and his mission is not made specially for him alone. It is made for all of us, for every one of us. And I really wonder why do some people try to hamper him and stop him from what he is doing? Let's just ignore the reason he gave in the lecture for doing what he is doing. And I say, nevertheless, why are these people trying to hamper him from what he is doing? Because most of us, we, those who have the book before anybody else, have that conscious. We don't like to see somebody coming from South Africa and talk about Islam. We think we have monopolized Islam. This is our own idea, we have to get out of our heads and we have to face reality and we have to face facts. He is going to face a man in America about, is the Bible God's word? Attack him in his own home, in his own subject. And what do we do? We tell him, we Muslims are not yet good Muslims. We have to be good Muslims. <laughs> How many centuries will it take us to be good Muslims? It's astonishing. It's astonishing. If we keep on with this logic, we will never be good Muslims and we will never go outside our own doorstep to reach the others. And our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, Convey the message further from me even with a single ayah of the Quran. Be what type of defeatism are we living in? Don't we have conscience? Don't we have feelings? Don't we have faith anymore? 
that we disobey the orders of our prophet. For who said how are we doing this? We are receiving all the kufr methods pouring to us through television, through magazines, through goods, through consumption. We are doing nothing against it. And when we find one man whom we hope that God will give him long life, long life, long life, to keep on doing the thing he is doing because it is good and because we are not doing it. When we find such a man, we should give him support. I am really asking all of you to give that support. And the support you can give to this man is to study his works, to listen to his audio tapes, to see his video tapes, and to follow his arguments, memorize them, use them. I think that's the best method. Now I have a question, a very small one. Is it not time that we should ask the question, is the Qur'an God's word? Uh, the Christians are doing that for us. They are coming now into our homes and they are challenging us about the Qur'ans. You see, we ourselves, we didn't wake ourselves up, but the enemy, Allah is making them to prod you to study the Qur'an. I could have given you numerous, exam numerous examples about the methods, how they use the Qur'an against the Muslim. See? So it's something, inshallah, is through the enemy, is Allah makes it. He makes his enemy to do his work for him. He made Firaun to look after Musa alayhi salam. You know, that's his job. Then he can do it. So now, is the Christians, they are now making you to read the book, the Quran. For example, I was just telling um, somebody uh, this afternoon about a new type of attack against our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I will end with this, you see. Uh, the new type of attack, they said, you see, your Prophet sallallahu alayhi the Holy Prophet Muhammad, he was not only an only unlettered, but he was also a jahil, ignorant. He was ummi and a jahil. And ummi can guide. If he has knowledge, he can guide you. But a jahil is going to mislead you. So what are you talking about? What are you referring to? So the Christian says, says you see in Surah Maryam, it says there, you know, verse 23 says, فَأَتَتَ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ So at length she brought the babe to her people. After the birth of... Uh, yeah. Maryam al -Islam being pregnant she retires to a remote place in the east and after the birth of the child she returns carrying this little infant Allah describes the scene so the, her people says Qalu, ya Maryam, laqad shayan fariya. So, oh, so, and the people said oh Mary truly an amazing thing has now brought we are shocked Ya ukhta Haruna, O sister of Harun, Ma kana abu kim raasawim, Wa ma kanat ummu ki baghiya. Said your father was not a man of evil, nor was thy mother a woman unchaste. How is it that you brought this child without a husband? Alleging that this is illegitimate. Now the charge is, Ya ukhta Haruna, So o sister of Harun, is your prophet didn't know that Hazrat Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam, they had a sister called Miriam, same as Maryam in Arabic and Mary in English. And Hazrat Isa alayhi salam has a mother called Maryam, Mary or Miriam, same. But your prophet is getting confused between that Maryam and this Maryam. And the gap in time is 1300 years between that Maryam and this Maryam. Your prophet didn't know the difference. So, our learned man says, no, you see, this is a, a, a beautiful way of showing her relationship. Maryam alayhi salam was a very, from the leading, the, the daughters of among the uh, imams of the Bani Israel, Hazrat Harun alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam were Levites, and imamat was a family tradition. It was a family tradition, and in that family tradition, Maryam alayhi salam is born. So the charge is, you come from such a noble priestly family, your father was a good man, your mother was a good woman, how is it that you brought this child without a husband? And we Muslims, we agree with the argument. Beautiful. Beautiful explanation. But the Christian nods his head, he says, no, no, you're whitewashing your prophet. He didn't know the difference. So now, see, you have to put on your thinking cap, he's attacking the Quran. So if you know the enemy's book, as Allah is commanding you to know, is a kul hautu burhanakum, produce your evidence, he has produced it, use that. So in a meeting like this, a Christian missionary threw this at me. 
So I said, you see, the answer to your problem is in your book. It is in your book. I said, where? I said, the first book of the New Testament. Chapter 1, verse 1. 1, 1, 1. You'll never forget when you have three aces in a game of cards. You know, three aces. This is a sure win. You know that. Three aces. There's only one left and anybody can have that. You got three. It says, first book, chapter one. First book, chapter one, verse one. He said, what does it say? I said, it says, this is the generation of Jesus Christ. Means his genealogy, his birth, his ancestors, who they were. The son of Abraham, the son of David. I said, right. He said, right. The book says, the son of Abraham. Isa is the son of Abraham. He is the son of David. As in the Gospel of Luke, it says he's the son of Joseph. In the Gospel of Mark, he says the son of God. So Abraham is his father, David is his father, Joseph is his father, and God is his father. A person who's got four fathers, what do you call him in your colloquial language, in the street? He said, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? You tell me now. He said, no, you see, he comes from that... Um, noble family of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He comes from the kingly family of Daud alayhi salam. He is supposed to be the son of Joseph, but really he is the son of God. So I said, look, you have to go into all that. But the book doesn't say that. He's the son of Abraham. Abraham is his father. Son of David. David is his father. Son of Joseph. Joseph is his father. Son of God. God is his father. Four fathers. A man with four fathers. So you see now you have to defend yourself. And the best defense is attack. <laughs> Jazakallah. شكرا <تصفيق> من شهر نوفمبر المعرض الخامس للكتاب المعاصر ويستمر لمدة 12 يوم حيث نجد الكثير من الكتب وبخاصة الكتب الدينية إذا تراوح ما يوجد في المعرض حوالي 4000 عنوان تشمل كافة علوم الدين والفقه وبجانب معرض الكتاب هناك العديد من التظاهرات الصغافية المصاحبة للمعرض ونرجو أن تحظى دائما برضا Thank you very much for your presence and we thank Mr. Didat for this lovely evening. Thank you very much.